You're listening to eLearn Chat, where talk is knowledge. Hello and welcome to eLearn Chat, our new podcast featuring prominent leaders, shakers and movers in the e-learning and training industry. Good morning, good day, good whatever you are. Hey everyone, it is April 25th, 8 a.m. Pacific time. This is eLearn Chat, episode number 56. Next to me right over here is Colleen Sunley. Hey, Colleen. Good morning, Rick. How are you? I am doing really well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm really excited about today's show. Yeah. Now, for all of you who are wondering if we're actually right next to each other, because I'm looking at her right now, and she's not that far from me. Um, we are not. But it's pretty cool. We look like we're right next to each other almost. Yeah, we're amazing. about 110 miles away from each other. Mm -hmm. So anyway, today we have a different eLearn chat. You know, we always have interview guests. Today we have no guests. We have you in the chat room. We have you on Twitter. And our topic today is pet peeves. Not that any of us have any pet peeves. Pet peeves, predictions, what we predict for the future or the past or whatever we come up with. And pastuff, things that just kind of come into our heads and we'll, we'll run with it. So yeah. this is really your show today as far as, well, it's always your show, but it's your show as far as getting involved, giving us uh, some direction if you want. In the meantime, we can start. Um, we're going to start with a little small promotion for a friend of ours. And this is kind of an apropos prom promotion since there are quite a few people that are still looking for jobs out of work in this industry or want to improve their presentation skills. Uh, their interviewing skills. And there is a book for that. It's by Gail Murphy. She is a very famous Hollywood correspondent. Very good gal, real fun person to be around. And it is called Interview Tactics. Now, I'm about halfway through the book, and, and it is a very pleasant read. I'm having a lot of fun with the book. Uh, she's a great writer, and she makes a lot of good points about if you want to do anything with yourself, you have to tell it to sell it. In other words, you have to tell about yourself to sell yourself. That's a real good point because if you're looking for a job, if you're looking to change, if you're looking to advance your career, you can't do that unless you can really sell yourself. Your skill set's important, but you also have to have the ability to sell yourself. Anyway, that's a great book. If you're interested, you can buy that on Amazon or go to www.interviewtactics.com. Well, Colleen, that was our very first actually our second ad mm -hmm. yeah so, so i think that's the direction we're going to be taking the show in the future rick sure we we want to we want to get a little bit of advertising and, and monitors now now mind you we're doing this for gail as a friend so we're, mm -hmm. not, we're not charging her for this because right Gail's cool um but anyway in the future we are going to do a little bit more ad work so because we are buying new equipment we're going to be spending about twenty five thousand dollars on new equipment so right. we want to make sure we can monetize some of that now let's talk about pet peeves. Uh, yeah, do you want to get started, Rick? What's, what's I can your pet peeve? I can start. Well, okay. One of my big pet peeves is the state of the industry as far as e-learning development goes. Mm -hmm. There are good products out there. There aren't that many great products, and this is an issue because right now quality in almost all products in almost any kind of development, whether it's Microsoft, Adobe, whether it's Google, we don't have a lot of rigor in our engineering practices in today's day and age. And part of the problem is we are rushing releases out. This has been an issue for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Rather than put out good versions of products, we're rushing out mediocre versions of products. And that's every vendor or most vendors. And <clears throat> I'll, I'll give a rare exception. One of the few vendors in this industry, or there's two vendors, in this industry that really put out consistently solid products. And that would be Trivantis, because frankly, Lectora is about as clean as it gets in, mm -hmm. in what it does. And the other one would be Camtasia or TechSmith. They right. both solidly put out great products. Yeah, and, I agree with you. And you know, um, you know TechSmith, why, TechSmith they, they do uh, Snagit as well, right? Yeah, they do Snagit, Camtasia, mm -hmm. they've got some other products. Mm -hmm. you've, you've got, uh, Trivantis, which also incorporates many of the TechSmith products. And, and I really appreciate the fact that I don't spend a lot of time when I work on their products working around issues. 
Mm-hmm. This is one of my biggest pet peeves as a developer, as somebody who runs a company that does development for other people. We spend a lot of time fixing issues, not only for mm-hmm. our clients, but as we do our own development. Right. And that shouldn't be happening. You know, yeah. these products aren't that difficult that they should have that many issues to to contend with. And that's been a trend, like I said, for about at least 15 or 20 years. I, I, you know what? Mm-hmm. Let, let's give it from about the late 1990s. Mm-hmm. Well, we've been rushing out products and you know we all have some good products we work with and we all have a lot of products that just aren't there yet right and and the only people who pay for that are us mm-hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so that's that's one of my initial pet pe- peeves i think one of my pet peeves uh rick would be you know when you work with an organization uh, especially as an external consultant and you have to um, you know, they, they have a lot of rules, etc., which I totally get. One of my biggest pet peeves is security. And I understand the value of security and securing your data, etc. What I have a problem with is when they have a lot of rules about firewalls, security, this and that and the other, and their employees are taking uh, files out of the office with a USB. <laughs> I, I just don't get that, you know. And they, they have websites blocked like YouTube, things that can actually help the employees. You know, sometimes you have a really quick question, you want a solution to, you go online, you Google it, there's a YouTube video, it's blocked. But you can download 8 gigs of data on your flash drive and walk out of the office with it at the end of the day. I just don't get that. Well, that's, that's called government security. <laughs> so... You know, mm-hmm. that, that, that is a good point. I had a friend who used to work at TRW years ago. This is about 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. And he walked out once with a big tape, one of those 10-inch mm-hmm. tapes. And he opened his briefcase. The guy looked at it and goes, okay. Didn't even ask. And I right. asked him, why are you taking your tape? He goes, I have to do work at home. <laughs> so I was just going, uh-huh. okay, you have a tape drive at home, whatever. Um, but, you know, you just kind of shake your head sometimes and you're right. Uh, now, I, I will agree and disagree with you on that one because what happens with things like YouTube and, and Twitter and everything else is at a certain level of employee, yeah, that's probably adequate because they're doing research, they're doing other things. At some levels of employee, they really don't need that mm-hmm. because they don't have to go to YouTube. They don't have to go to Twitter. They are on phones. They're doing a lot of stuff that really requires focus, attention, and it's not the most exciting work, and they're not being paid to do a lot of research or anything else. So I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the devil's advocate approach on that because if you let everybody in a corporation get on YouTube, you don't have enough bandwidth inside a corporation to do that. Right, and you know, I think it goes, you know, it, 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 you know, it's more of a, if it's available, I think people won't abuse it. If it's not available, I think that's when the abuse, you know, starts seeping in. In some cases. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I mean, and of course every organization is different. So this is just a, more of a blanket thing, you know, how you manage your security, how you manage your data, and how you're concerned about data and you know, you're avoiding things like enterprise social. So, for example, a tool like Yammer, you will not allow into your organization because of security. And you have people moving out of uh, uh, files on flash drive. So that, you know, that's just one of my my pet peeves. Um, right. Though, though, yeah. though it depends on the people. Because, again, mm-hmm. it, with the flash drives, most of the people don't have access to that. It depends on the company. Mm-hmm. The big companies have it pretty pretty tight. The smaller companies, it's much more of a free for all. Mm-hmm. So it just it just depends. But but right. you're right. I mean, I I do a lot of research on YouTube. I think you do too. We're ready to buy products. It's it's on YouTube looking for reviews, looking for ways to use it. Or if you buy something, you go, how do I use this? Mm-hmm. Uh, let's, oh, that's another pet peeve. Nothing comes with manuals that are worthwhile anymore. Right. You buy something. You buy whether it's software, whether it's products. If you buy a video camera, whatever you buy. Mm-hmm. please just throw the manual away save the paper you haven't put anything good in these manuals mm-hmm. put it on pdf it's not even worth reading the hard copy anymore 90 percent of the products have useless doc- documentation um, yeah uh, if you look at the software products they have almost no documentation yeah so that's what that's good are history. they i mean we're just wasting time opening up something putting it on a shelf and gathering dust so this is this is another one if you're going to put out a manual make it a good manual make it useful if the manual has tutorials, make them actually work. Mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've opened up so much software and I go through a tutorial and the tutorial doesn't work. It's got bugs in it. 
And uh, yeah. you just go, you just kind of shake your head and go, all right. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and by the way, just for, for a little bit of clarification of what our backgrounds are, uh, Colleen has a degree in IT. I think you've got a degree in, you've got a couple of degrees. Well, business management with an emphasis in information systems. Yeah, which is almost the same thing I had. I have a business mm-hmm. administration degree with, uh, with an MIT or MIT, MIS, mm-hmm. and back in mm-hmm. those days, management information right. systems, information technology today, IT. Um, and I also have almost, uh, almost had a full engineering degree, and then I switched majors right about like less than a year ago. So, mm-hmm. you know, our backgrounds, and my, my background is I worked in IT for 25 years. I worked not only implementing as an independent company, the first thing that our company did was implement um, manufacturing systems, distribution, financial software packages for mid to large clients. Mm-hmm. And you know, we have a lot of experience working all over the industry. And you know, we've seen it from the IT perspective, from the e-learning perspective. So we've seen a lot of different kinds of of ways to implement things, to run things, both good and bad. I, I've been on both sides of the trenches, both on the IT side, which owns the pipes that everybody is using, mm-hmm. uh, or I shouldn't say owns, they control the pipes that people are using within a company, as well as on the learning side where you know we've helped companies and, and I've worked with companies and you have to. So you know it, it gives you different perspectives as to what mm-hmm. goes on in a corporation you kind of know where where the the glitches are if you've got an IT background you usually know what the where the glitches are within IT within bandwidth what the requirements are and you know that that kind of brings up another pet peeve and that is mm-hmm. when people develop courses in e-learning and and we're all guilty of this from time to time mm-hmm. nobody nobody thinks about bandwidth so people right. throw out these 100 megabyte videos in the middle of a let's say captivate course and then they go my performance is slow. No, really? <clears throat> Think about this. A hundred megabyte video. And maybe it's not even streaming. You've just got a hundred megabyte. You've got no streaming video server. So you've got one big chunk of a hundred megabytes that's trying to load out there. And you're mm-hmm. going through a vendor like, let's say, Taleo. So now you've got your vendor who's on the outside. You've got the stuff coming into your organization. The video is 100 megabytes, among other things that are in that course, and you have 10,000 people taking the course at once. You have no bandwidth. Right. And people don't consider the fact that, you know, we're not compressing stuff that much anymore. Mm -hmm. They feel, well, everybody's got a lot of bandwidth. Well, that's true at home, maybe. Depends where you are. But Mm -hmm. in most organizations, you don't have a lot of bandwidth. You compete and vie for the same bandwidth that the rest of your corporation has. Right. That means you've got to make sure your pieces are small. The bigger you make your piece, if you're doing everything at 44, 100, or even worse, I've seen people do higher levels of audio. I even saw a recommendation in a book recently saying, make all your voiceover narration 128K. What are you, insane? <laughs> That's three times larger than a 44, 1K almost. And as a result, you're going to be wasting everybody's bandwidth on audio. Now, mm-hmm. now, Colleen and I have both done voiceover. We both like audio. We do a lot of audio recording. You cannot make audio that's 128K for e-learning. If you do, mm-hmm. great. Put it on a CD or a DVD or something or a Blu-ray. But don't, you can't do it as part of an online learning course. If you do, mm-hmm. your course will just die. That's a lot of bits. And, right. and that's another thing when people... When they don't compress things, everybody pays for it, and you have very slow performance. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter if you keep your content external. That's Those are large files. Mm-hmm. Just something to keep in mind that if you want to do a large screen size, and no, you can't do screens that are 1920 by 1080 in the e-learning. It's going to be huge. <laughs> Remember, those are pixels. They take up space. Right. Um, you know, this, uh, What we're seeing right now is mostly 1024 by 768 as far as sizes and those are still somewhat large sometimes depending mm-hmm. on, on the content yeah but so uh we have um polycom learning trisha in the chat allen room. i'm sorry that's trisha allen trisha <laughs> awesome and um her pet peeve uh, i'm guessing she's okay with me mentioning her name um i won't say the specifics but it's basically smes who don't understand about instructional design 
and they come to you with a shopping list of things that they want in the training and they want it uh, as, you know, 35 modules versus understanding that you can chunk some of this stuff and, you know, condense it because you get the same outcome. So they're insistent on, we want these 35 modules with these specific topics. Right, and that's a typical SME problem. And, and I mm -hmm. think one of the issues is, as instructional designers, it's our responsibility also to work with them to try to put sanity back into their brains. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing worse than, than working on a, on a one and a half hour lesson in e-learning. Mm -hmm. one, uh, one hour or one and a half hours, one lesson. And you're telling people, okay, you gotta be at your desk. We have a lot of work to do. Oh, and by the way, you have an hour and a half lesson just for this. Don't don't mm -hmm. move. Don't breathe. Don't go potty. Don't do anything. Um, that's a lot of. That's a long lesson for adults. Mm -hmm. um, and they've done just enough research that adults do best with chunks of information. Mm -hmm. I'd rather do a two to five minute course. Take a look at Lynda.com. A perfect right. example. Lynda.com has a great method of doing training. These are short two to five minute videos. Occasionally, you'll have a five to ten minute video. But two to five minutes is the average length, let's say five. That's a good chunk. You can find information specifically for what you're looking for without having to go through an hour and a half or an hour of one lesson. And by the way, the bigger your lesson, the more bandwidth you're taking up. So we go back to that other point again. So these are, these are, these are good points. And a lot of the SMEs may know their content, but they don't have a clue about how to deploy it. That's our responsibility mm -hmm. and job to teach them. Here's how you do it. Most of the time they get it, sometimes they don't, but, mm -hmm. and you know what? We have told companies over and over, you know, this is not a good strategy moving forward. You're gonna have these issues. I don't care. Well, no, mm -hmm. no, I mean, you really care, and no, I don't right. care. No, but I mean, right. seriously, you care, I don't care. Okay, fine, what can you do? You give it to them. After a while, you yeah. can only put it in writing, make a point, give it to them, and then they go, doesn't work. No, really, come on. Yeah, uh, that's, that's one of the pet peeves that I have is, you know, organizations who come to you and they say, we want training. Well, have you even figured out if training is the right solution or is the right approach or the right intervention for the issue that you're having? Yes, it is training. And then you deliver the training, you know, at their insistence and it doesn't work. And of course, you get blamed for it. And, you know, to some extent... The blame is on us, for, you know, because you, you, you have to insist, okay, this isn't going to work. But then at the end of the day, you still have bills to pay. You still need to do what you have to do to, to make a living. So you, you deliver it and it doesn't work. It's, yeah, it's, it's another it's, pet peeve of it's mine. It's our job to try to make it as clear and clean as possible. And then hopefully the communication is good and, and things are are good. Now, mm -hmm. that kind of brings up a secondary peeve, and this is a peeve with learning organizations on the whole. Uh, this is something we've actually seen in person. I went to, a, uh, I won't give the name of the, of the place, but it was a, an, a public organization in Los Angeles where we went to talk to them about e-learning and creating some courseware. And the guy we talked to was getting ready to retire, and he was kind of in the dungeon, like in the deep basement of this place. And he said, you know, I'm not going to do anything. At which point we're kind of wondering, why are we here? Why did we even come out and waste our time? I'm not going to do anything because I'm retiring soon and nobody has seen me for five years and I'm going to keep it that way. Okay. Um, and this is so common of a lot of learning. There's some really good learning organizations. There are some that just kind of sit in the background, hide, and, and they're not proactive. Mm -hmm. and, and one of my biggest gripes is there's a lot of BS in learning, if you will, that just doesn't make any business sense. Companies right. really don't care the neuropsychology of how people learn. They just don't care that much. Mm -hmm. And as instructional designers of trainings, we can't focus that much on it because there's work that needs to be done. There's a lot of theory behind everything that's being done in, in the learning and training and, and cognitive approaches to, to just about everything. But if we get muddled up in that to the point where nothing's actually getting done, or if we become pristine and it has to be just so and perfect and it takes forever to develop a course, mm -hmm. um, then training departments have no clout. They, they have no influence because people perceive them as slow. 
mm -hmm. as not really being with the business, not understanding what the objectives are, not mm -hmm. really putting out the kind of training that people want to see. Um, right. or, or training that is job specific. You know, we don't put training out just because, hey, we got a job and this is cool. We put training out to help the business. If we're not helping the business, well, we're not helping anybody and or the organ, whatever organization it is. So these are just things that that we've got to be aware of. In, in a learning organization, it's all about the organization and what the needs are. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen just way too many learning departments going off in the weeds talking college level theory that no one cares about. And, and frankly, it's just, that's nice. Um, yeah, because at the end of the day, you really want to affect change. You want the participant or the person who's attending the training to be able to do X, Y, Z better or less of X, Y, Z or whatever it is. I mean, you're not there to deliver a degree or a diploma or whatever. It's just do this better. And by doing this better, the organization functions better and we make more money, which is pretty, you know, it's pretty basic. Well, yeah. When was the last time somebody you know in an organization said, how will my training affect the bottom line? You know, I ask that question all the time. And sometimes I get this like there in the headlights look like, what do you mean? I'm like, you're not thinking about what we're, what we're talking about here. You need to tie it back somehow to whether this is going to help your business or not. I don't care ab about, I mean, I do care about um, making sure that you're compliant and all of that. But you have to understand that compliance connects back to the business as well. Don't just think of compliance and doing compliance training as just something you have to check off, you know. It does, because if you don't, com if you don't meet your compliance or your regulations, then you can get fined and, now that's what, you know. That's, now, that's so, another pet peeve. We have way too much compliance in the workplace where we waste a ton of money for really some stupid reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I call that government getting involved in way too many things in, inside of a, of a company that mm -hmm. are just a waste of time. I mean, there is everything has to be half compliance. And after a while, you just go, ah, does it ever end? And mind you, I've, we've written a ton of courses in compliance. I've written my share. And mm -hmm. some of them are interesting, but you just go, there's just so much compliance. And mm -hmm. that's in, in a lot of ways, it's not like and, and, and for training to think that this is going to be fun. Uh, most people take compliance because they have to, not because they want to. Right. Um, and most compliance courses are about like getting a root canal without anesthesia. Mm -hmm. It's not the most fun thing to go through. So, you know, if you're going to do a compliance course, try to have some fun with it. You don't have to be super serious, no matter what the lawyers mm -hmm. say. Um, yeah. But anyway, we've actually had some fun compliance courses, and yeah. people learn from that much more than just reading through facts. Yeah, I've seen some of your work. You know, I mean, without, you know, mentioning specific clients, you know, the the particular one I'm thinking about is the guy with the, you know, who drove off with the cone on the back of his truck. Yeah. That was for, uh, we did something for Southern California Edison, and it was, mm -hmm. these were team building compliant, it was all safety training. Mm -hmm. um, but they did it in such a way, and they wrote these actually, and they did a great job of creating compliance training that was fun. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of fun with it, and, and internally, the end result was something like a 95% drop in accidents. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't do better than that. I mean, you can do 99% right. maybe, but that's excellent. And th these are people who deal with a lot of power. Uh, mm -hmm. One wrong move and they're crispy critters. So we have to be careful with that kind of stuff. Uh, but they took a fun approach. Mm -hmm. and, and this based on uh, some of this training was, was issued after somebody had actually died from an accident. So they tried to make a positive statement out of that. Not the fact that the person died, but... Let's really work hard so that doesn't happen again. Because when somebody mm -hmm. does get hurt, it affects everybody in their place. And you can feel right. it. It's, it's just like, like being in the military. When someone goes, everyone feels it. And, yeah. and I think that's the same approach. But they had fun doing mm -hmm. that kind of training. And that, that made it different. Right. Um, any any comments in the chat room right now? Well, you know, just uh, you know, some of the things we we're talking about, dealing with SMEs and, you know, the organization and trying to sell um, – the fact that, you know, the training needs to tie back to a business need and some of the folks saying that, you know, when they push back, they get the attitude, but I am the SME. So, you know, I think we all have to deal with that whenever we we're de designing or delivering training or, or approaching any kind of uh, learning intervention. Um, uh, one of my other pet peeves... Uh, Rick, you know, some of the terminology that we see floating around, bouncing off the wall, um, 
uh, thought leaders. I hate, hate, hate. And for all of you who follow me on Twitter or who I follow on Twitter, if this offends you, I apologize. But I hate the expression thought leader. Yes, Whose I, thoughts are you leading? Yours? Mine? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too clear. And then one person uses it. And then now everyone uses the, the expression thought leader. Well, and it makes me insane. Well, and it's on advertisement for training. It's on conference advertisements. It's everywhere. It's uh, come hear these thought leaders. Come see these thought leaders. Right. It's a, uh, it's business. There's a, there's a really good book. I think it's called "Why Business People Speak Like Idiots." It's an excellent book, and it highlights some large companies like Accenture and GE, where they don't communicate in English. They communicate in Meta Talk, mm -hmm. and Meta Talk is nothing more than using either big words or big language to say nothing. Mm -hmm. So it, if they're going to announce that there's a layoff. They have about 300 words to give some real nondescript example of why they have to do what they're doing. And the words are just idiotic. And it does just say, we're not doing well, we have to do layoffs. Boy, wouldn't that be clear? Mm -hmm. No, you have to do this based on current company demands and future projections and our finite forecasting system. We've come to the, and right. it just goes on and on. And look, mm -hmm. we're not doing well. Nobody lets people go because they're doing well. They're letting people go because they're not doing well. Um, right. Why don't you just speak clearly? In business, if you're not speaking clearly, you're just not getting your point across. But then and, who, as, who anoints you a thought leader, though? Oh, that's completely self-anointed. Well, that's that's you go to the my thought, point. Oh, wait, wait, Colleen. You don't know about the thought leader council? <laughs> I think I see them out there. Yes, <laughs> they're anointing each other. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and annoying everyone else, annoying, annoying, you know, this kind of, <laughs> anyway, right. no, seriously, I mean, the whole concept of a thought leader is, look, you could be influential, you could have some good thoughts, uh, but leading, a thought leader, somebody who has such a great intellect that they are leading the thoughts of other people, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I've never liked that either. I think that's one mm -hmm. of those kind of idiotic terms from the early 2000s somewhere, mm -hmm. and and people run with it because it sounds good, but but what it is the thought? To I, used to, away, I used to ask you know. people, you know, do you put your thoughts on a leash? You take them out once a day to clean them up, you know, go potty right. with, your, with your thoughts. And, you know, Colleen asked me the other day, she goes, oh, that's a good pose. You kind of look thought leader-esque. I almost gagged on that one. And well, I that's because no. you, know you know I hate the expression. Yeah. And, and so, so, so pulling your her, leg. I told her, my thoughts are free range. So <laughs> they're not controlled. Um, they're organic. But, and I understand why people do that. I understand why shows do that because it makes people sound like they're more important and stuff. And there are people in the industry who have something to offer. And you know, all of us have something to offer in one way or another. Maybe some people don't, but a lot of people have some things that we can offer. But to anoint ourselves or to basically go around going, I'm a thought leader. One, that's, that's consummate arrogance. And mm -hmm. two, if you believe it, great. Does that mean anybody else believes it? Probably not. But, um, and again, no insult meant to anybody, but right. it's just one it's of those just... marketing terms that I think is overused. And and frankly, given the state of most of the industry, it's it's really not very applicable. Yeah, so, it's like okay, bury it now, move on. Let's find something else to yeah. drive me crazy. <laughs> I'd much be ex more excited if you're a good cook. Thought leader, God. Yeah. Okay, I don't even want to think about it anymore. I'd rather hear a culinary leader, somebody who makes really good pasta. Anyway, that's <laughs> that's me. I'm part Italian. So Trisha is saying. Um, so here are some other terms that folks are in the chat room are throwing in there. Um, cadence. Cadence. Okay. Yes. Another one. Mission critical. Here's some I like that here's one. Some cadence for you. You know, when that cadence stops, we stop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mission critical. That's another good mission one. Mission critical. Now, you know, how many of you have ever been on a real mission? That's one of my favorites. You know, that, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a military term that got put into the, into the, uh, the business world. We're on mm -hmm. a mission critical project. Really? Now, where are we going with this mission critical project? And what troops are being sent out to, uh, to do this mission? And, you know, it sounds good, but nobody knows what the mission is. When was the last time in a corporation somebody told you what the mission actually was? Now, we have mission statements, and some of them are great. Our job is to make people happy. Well, great, but that's a really overarching uh, right. thought. How do you make people happy when they're not and, happy And themselves? how many of the people do you want to make right. happy? Do you want to make all of them happy? Yeah. Some of them? Half of them? Yeah. You know, our job is to put out the best products in the world. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's that's fairly honest. You can try, um, but the mission statements are usually somewhat, somewhat. Sometimes they're really idiotic. But 
it makes people feel happy. And but when you go on a mission critical project, mm -hmm. what is the mission? Is the mission your organization? Is it something else? Is it a party? What is the mm -hmm. mission? And you're right. It's just one of those terms. It's it's an, again meta talk. Yeah, you know another term I can't stand is known issue, especially when it comes to software. Well, yeah, so no, you buy software, no, you download issue. it, no, you start using it. No, no, Colleen, that's a feature nowadays. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it is. Yes. And then you go on to, you know, you start using the software, whatever, and um, okay, it's broken. You realize it's not working. So you check into the forums, and the first thing you see is, this is a known issue, and here is the workaround. I don't want a workaround. I just paid like $2,000 for your software. I want this working. Yeah. No, no I'll... I'll Give software vendors credit. I wouldn't call it an issue. I'd call it known bugs. You know, it's a mm -hmm. bug. No, nobody wants to call things bugs anymore, though. These, right. are, these are issues. It's okay. an issue. Or it's a feature, depending on how you look at it. My software doesn't work well, so if I work around it, I've got a feature. I've just right. discovered a new feature. It's called the workaround. So, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. It's, it's one of those great euphemistic things. Here are known issues. Oh, what, I, what really irritates me is when you get new software or updates from people, and they don't tell you what they updated. Mm -hmm. Well, how do I know what's been fixed? You don't. Right. So if you're going to do any kind of software update, let us know what you fixed and why, because then mm -hmm. people can actually go use those things that you just updated. Otherwise, you're yeah. still doing the same old, same old, working around problems that may have been fixed, but you don't know until mm -hmm. somebody else who has nothing better to do is playing with it for hours and hours and goes, hey, I figured out, I figured out it works now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, vendors, right. vendors, we actually work for a living. Try not to waste our time because mm -hmm. we won't buy your products if you do. Searching anyway. for fixes for Searching your known for issues. Searching for fixes for known issues. Yep, that's a good one. Um, well, let's see. We've been doing some pet peeves for about a half hour. Anybody else in the chat room have any pet peeves? There's got to be some. So someone says, uh, I believe it's Crystal, says when she's doing um, a mission statement, she says, I always put forward to make as much money as for as little effort as possible when companies or teams insist on a mission statement Crystal first. is on her way up. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That is a good one. You know, mm -hmm. and it's honest. Yeah. What are we here it, for? We it actually work uh, to make some money. That's at the end of the day what it all amounts to. The whole fluff and the cream on top is just, you know, fluff. It's fun. Um, it's it's cappuccino, right? That, there you go. With with bad espresso. <laughs> so yeah. I'm I'm not seeing any more activity in the chat room. Right. Uh, do you have any more pet peeves? Oh, Rick? I've got tons, but I don't want to bore people too much with the pet peeves. Let's talk about sure. predictions a little bit. Okay. Have you thought of any predictions? Things you think are going to happen either now or hey you know what we were thinking of doing predictions that already happened therefore we sound really smart we would be thought leaders prediction leaders go. we would be prediction leaders we would be <laughs> foreseers of the future <laughs> so right um let's see well you know yesterday i you know they google came out with the google drive thing and everybody's not everyone but it's been you know i've been seeing the, the topic trending on twitter etc and I tweeted something out about the features, and someone responded to me by saying um, they're going to stick with Dropbox based on Google's, you know, Google's history. Mm -hmm. And I can see where they're coming from when you have things like Google Wave and stuff that just, you know, evaporated. Uh, Dropbox has one product that they're focusing on, yeah. whereas Google's got their hands in everything. And, and you know what? Google is putting out a lot of mediocre stuff. I still, I still think Android's fairly mediocre. Um, mm hmm it's just not as good as other vendors like Apple because it's much more free form. It, mm -hmm. or, or the OS just isn't, they're catering to a, to a certain market. And mm -hmm. I don't know, we talked about this last week with RJ about the right. tablets, the Android tablets just haven't sold much. Right. And there's a good reason for it. They suck, mm -hmm. but that's, that's another thing. Um, and that's an opinion. But they're right, just not yeah. as good as, let's say, an iPad, you could tell. From workmanship all the way to the actual operating system, mm -hmm. it's just not as clean. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I mean, when you think about Google, and I understand what they're trying to do in terms of making everything seamless. You have one Google account, you have your Google profile, and it connects to your Docs and your Gmail and your Google Plus, etc. Um, it's like, you know... Uh, 
if if it doesn't work, it flops. And from what I'm seeing, I mean, I have a G Google Plus account, and I hardly ever use it because I spend most of my time on Twitter. I I don't use Facebook that much. But it doesn't look like it, it ju I just get the impression that there's a lot of noise on, on Google Plus. Well, there's a lot of noise on everything. Oh, well, there, there is. But I See, mean, I like Google Plus better than I like Facebook. It's cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot easier to work with. I just don't use any of them all that much because I just right. don't have the time. Um, but yeah, I I think I like the look and feel of Google Plus a little bit better. And I think one of the problems is right now we're all vying to get on something. Everybody wants to be seen on something because if you're not on these, your business won't be noticed or this and that. And so I think we're we're forced into things that maybe aren't even all that good. I mean, mm -hmm. do you, Facebook, okay. Um, Google Plus, okay. Do you really need it? No. Do you want mm -hmm. it? Maybe. Is it crucial? No. But we're training people to have to go to these places to find information. Mm -hmm. And and know. it's like you're not the cool kid on the block if you don't you know, have a Google right. Plus account or you don't have a this or that. So right. yesterday I was able to get into Google Drive because uh, apparently they're, of course, doing a phased rollout. So I was able to get in on one of my Google accounts and... I was looking at it, you know, checking things out. I'm not, like, blown away by it. And I think a big part of it is because there's collaboration tools, and if not everyone that I know has access to it, who am I going to collaborate with? Well, it's, it's even hard enough in corporations to get Dropbox in sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you've got Box, you've got Dropbox, there's some other ones, and, you know, and there have been some that have disappeared. So you have to be mm -hmm. real careful as to who you go with. Uh, mm -hmm. Google's the big 10,000 pound gorilla and they might do a really good job mm -hmm. with Drive, but no one knows. Yeah, and of course they slash prices. It's like rock bottom pricing compared right. to Dropbox pricing. So right. in terms of predictions, I'm kind of, you know, on the fence with regard to the Drive Dropbox thing. I think um, hardcore Google users and people who do a lot of free stuff will stick with the Google Drive. And, but and, and I'll, I'll predict alongside of that, that Google will not be the big force to be reckoned with in 10 years like it is today. I think there's a natural tendency among people to not really like the mega giant corporations that are in every aspect of everything. That's what happened mm -hmm. to Microsoft. That's mm -hmm. what could happen to Apple. When, mm -hmm. when they're in everything or they try to control everything, people tend to get a little bit more shy about it. And mm -hmm. to a certain point, it does kill innovation. Right. And so I think you're going to find better products from smaller companies in the future than you will from the huge monsters that are, they can't turn that fast and mm -hmm. they may not really be on the, on the pulse of what needs to be done. They mm -hmm. have their agenda like anything else. Google mm -hmm. is nothing more than really a big AdSense company. It's all about ads. That's mm -hmm. how they make their money. And everything around that is just little services they add. And they're okay. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Mm -hmm. But it's really all about AdSense and every chance they get to get ads. And then they charge you if you don't want to have ads. So it's, mm -hmm. kind, of, it's kind of an interesting uh, business model. It has worked for them. Look how big they are. Mm -hmm. But at one point, I wonder. Right. Yeah. Now, what do you think about cloud? I know everything is in the cloud now. Yeah. Do you think that's going to stay that way? You think it's going to just, we're going to totally go cloud? You know, I think it'll stay cloud as long as we have decent security. Mm -hmm. We have companies that are stable because the cloud mm -hmm. is not stable. Uh, you could have all your information right now. And there's one thing that's really bad. There are a lot of hackers out there and a lot of cloud services are getting hacked all the time. Credit card mm -hmm. companies are getting hacked. Right. There's just a lot of hacking going on and very mm -hmm. little... Um, very few arrests are being made in all these hacks. And as a result, mm -hmm. until you can stop protecting the consumers and the corporations and, and the government agencies, frankly, from, mm -hmm. from that kind of assault, then the cloud is always risky. We're all in right. the cloud. We all have right. cloud accounts. You know, if you want to call it the cloud, I always think that's a stupid term. Uh, but anyway, we're all in mm -hmm. web-based services in one way or right. another, whether it's emails or... Uh, websites or whatever, you know, we have to rely on the internet right now. Mm -hmm. If the internet went away tomorrow, would we all die? No, of course not. We all survive without it, but the internet's great. I wouldn't want to be without it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are also a lot of plans all around the world to control the internet and to make it very restricted, mm -hmm. uh, including in the U.S. There's a lot of plans in front of Congress to really restrict the internet, make it for pay, make, I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff that they don't like 
people doing whatever they want. And the Internet is a, one of the last frontiers of, uh, if you will, free speech and just about anything else. Mm -hmm. So, And there's a lot yeah. of good and bad on the Internet. So, you know, the, the Internet's not policing itself very well either. So mm -hmm. there, there's definitely issues in that, in that realm. Yeah. Now, do you have any e-learning predictions? Um, the only thing that I can think of today uh, would be the cloud as it relates to um, Adobe, the CS6. Hmm. I'm actually looking forward to that. Now, surprisingly yeah. enough, in the e-learning world, the cloud doesn't affect. Adobe did not consider the e-learning suite or anything else, so that's not mm -hmm. cloud-based. So it's okay. sort of interesting that at this point, that's not even considered one of their target areas. Um, and I think I think the vendors, I think all the vendors have to be careful right now because there, there are tools out there. There's a lot of tools. And I don't know how much new development is going on, but there are new mm -hmm. products being developed all the time. And mm -hmm. as those products mature, they could definitely pose a big threat to some of the bigger vendors. And I think where we'll see some differences, is my prediction, we will have maybe less megalith tools that do everything in the world and smaller tools that can handle parts of it very well that can all integrate together. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a prediction I have. And that's kind of based on the app model that Apple's doing, for example, and they, they really pioneered this mm -hmm. with, with their iPhone and iPad. The apps are really good, some of them, especially if you're talking mm -hmm. about graphics or any, anything that could be related to e-learning. You can develop some really good content mm -hmm. with simple apps. Wait till those apps now go on the desktop and make it real easy for people to, uh, to do things. Now, we were talking a little bit about social, about uh, uh, whatchamacallit, M learning. And I, I made a comment on the web the other day, and it was just a simple quote, but basically, M learning is a solution looking for a problem. Because most corporations don't really have much of an M learning problem, they don't care. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the reality is most corporations really don't care. Uh, right. I've talked to quite a few pundits in the industry who are pretty high up in some of these corporations, and they really don't care. There isn't that big a need in most corporations for M learning. They can mm -hmm. barely get e learning out. So right. to, to get, you know, we go back to the security issue, to the cost of tablets, to the cost of everything else. It's not going to happen anytime soon. It may never happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, e learning has been around for about 30 years. And they still call it a new industry. Uh, 30 years is a mature industry. If you still think it's new, you've been in cryogenic state for about 30 years and you haven't really gotten with the world. Um, it's, it's a BS cop-out for the fact that e-learning hasn't really gone where it should. I still hear that e-learning is a 10 billion a year industry. You know, nobody sees it. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe a couple of large vendors, and that's about it, are seeing it. And even they're not that large. Some of the largest e-learning vendors I know are only making like five to 10 or 15, 20 million a year. They're not huge. Mm -hmm. We're not talking billions and billions in e-learning. So it's just sort of interesting how that, uh, and I'm talking in services, and about product sales, that could change. That could be 50, 100 million on some mm -hmm. products. But even still, we're not talking enormous revenues in the e-learning arena like they've predicted for the last 10, 15, 20 years. So that's, my prediction is that probably won't change that much until there are some paradigm shifts in the way mm -hmm. that, that the learning is delivered. And I'm not talking right. about learning. I'm talking within companies to make e-learning development very quick. And mm -hmm. by quick, it means changing and adapting to business needs as they happen. A lot of the tools really don't do that yet. But mm -hmm. in, in the future, they might. Uh, I think we're getting there. And I think we, we're getting more into another prediction would be that in the future, we will chunk all information to very small, maybe one, two, three minute bites, and that's about mm -hmm. it. Uh, yeah. I think the day of, of one hour lessons is gonna go away. I agree, I think that's definitely something that we're gonna have to look forward to in the, you know, in the near future, is chunking in smaller bites. Yep. You know, um, so. And, and you know what, what happens, I, Colleen, if, if you eat in small bites, you get full quicker. Oh, good. So. Um, I should do that for my diet, huh? <laughs> um, so what I'm seeing, uh, the in the chat room the predictions okay so social learning it's gonna be it's gonna get bigger uh, we've always learned that way and it's just the the, the networking is the what the net um, is gonna be widening mm -hmm. um, so that's one uh, cloud e-learning tools is another one a prediction 
Hardware is the thing of the past. I don't, I'm not, I don't think that's a prediction. That's just you know, an observation. It's all about software right now. Well, yes and no, because without hardware, software doesn't run. Yeah. Um, the hardware is just going to get smaller, faster. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, not necessarily smaller. The form factors are pretty small already. It's going to get faster, and it's pretty fast mm -hmm. as it is. Um, you know, what people don't realize is on a lot of software routines, they run things that slow down the software so that you could see it because mm -hmm. that's how fast it really is. Uh, there's actually routines built to do loops of a million times just to slow something down. That's mm -hmm. how fast our processes have gotten. Um, that's an interesting one. What else do we have in there? Let's see. We have uh, e-learning tools on mobile apps. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, coming. Leva uh, says she used the word integration several times today. I think that's her keyword today is yeah. integration. Yeah, we need integration, good integration. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make another prediction. The learning management system in the future will not be put inside a company. It'll probably all be offloaded to outside vendors because it is not worth the time, effort, and money to run internal LMS systems. Also, I also predict LMS systems will have to get with the program and lower the prices because the ones that go in-house are just overpriced. They're not worth anywhere near what they're getting for them. And mm -hmm. you have companies like Teleo, GeoLearning, and others which can provide better solutions. Litmus is another one. Can provide hosted solutions for way less money for a corporation, mm -hmm. and and just a good a service. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's one of the trends we will see probably within five years. Um, and and you've got you know, things like Course Mill from Trivant is a great. I, I will take some of these small tools over any of the bigger ones. The bigger ones mm -hmm. are just overpriced, and frankly, most companies are spending millions trying to get them to work. Right. Just an issue. Now, someone's talking about uh, social enterprise, so like Yammer and Chatter and these tools replacing email. I would like to see that happen, but I tend to disagree in terms of it replacing email. I don't think it will replace email. I, I, I don't see that happening yeah, anytime soon. I think soon. it's just an add-on. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting. I mean, they work, but the amount of effort to... to I mean, emails are, leave a better document trail. And a lot of times it's just easier to get it to outside people. You can't really get the social networks right now to outside people. Uh, now, we might see an integration of email with social networks. That could be interesting. What was that, Rick? I missed I that. I said we, we could get an integration of email and social networking. That, that's right. something I could see. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, I, and I see little... Um, S small steps in that direction from the perspective of, so for example, Gmail, I use Gmail, and Gmail is starting to make the format of its email into that kind of conversation right. uh, look and feel. So it kind of is pulling in that or integrating that social side of it. Um, but in terms of, of wholesale movement or that complete paradigm, uh, shift and, and by uh, the way, to social. I don't think that'll happen. No, and by the way, Microsoft was doing that component of seeing a conversation for several years already. Mm -hmm. Outlook 2010 had that. You could see your when a conversation starts and where it's going. It's just not as graphical, but who cares? Right. I mean, it mm -hmm. does the same effect. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it kind of helps sometimes when you have a conversation, though sometimes it gets kind of long. Uh, and if you've got a very long conversation, that can get a little onerous for some people. And I'm going back, wait a minute, what did we say 35 messages ago? Um, you know, and the same with, you know, any tool can be justified or not, just depending on how it fits a particular organization. Right. It all comes down to the business need. Yep. Does it fit? Uh, Does it work? And if Does emails it... work, then, you know, why sure. switch? I know a lot, a lot of companies, big corporations use same time from Lotus, which, mm -hmm. which allows them to collaborate. It's basically chat, internal private chat. And it works really well for people to find out. You know, find people where they're at. If they don't want to always call them, they can just do a quick chat. People will not respond to the phone as quickly as they do to chat. That's a, that's mm -hmm. a change we've seen in the last, I'd say, probably about eight to ten years. Mm -hmm. so, Jeff yeah. saying that they use same time and it's great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it works. And it works really well because if you need to get a hold of somebody, um, and, and, you know, there are other services. Like a lot of people are using their, the Google chat and all that. Though I do have some issues with sometimes Google security. I, you know, my account got hacked not long ago. In fact, I know about 20, 30 people got hacked on Google. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Again, Chinese hack. I got hacked on iTunes recently, and I got hacked on Google, both from China. Very interesting. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Someone's asking the future in electronic medical data. Is it worth it to switch over? I'm not sure what you mean by uh, that. And I'm not clear too. I asked. I said, "Well, what do you mean?" So I'm hoping that they um, chime in again and kind of clarify what they're asking because I'm not sure what they're asking. Yeah, because electronic medical data, it, I mean, there are things where they're talking about having all of our data available. Mm-hmm. So any doctor you go to, it's all cloud-based. There's a lot of privacy issues with that. There's also a lot of possible abuse issues. Um, anytime you make everyone's information available, you run into the possibility of abuse. And you know, we see that all the time currently. Mm-hmm. You know, look how, yeah. many, look how many credit cards are getting stolen on a regular basis or how many. Right. It just, there's a lot of data out there and it's free form. It's, it's just out there and people can mm-hmm. buy it. Right. Uh, so someone said 35 messages ago. I can't remember what, what you said five <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> That's okay because we didn't say anything worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeff's like, what was that you said? <laughs> yeah, I think they're having fun now. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I think the personal medical data, though, is, you know, I think they're talking a lot about a flash drive you can travel with, and if you're in another sure. country, you have all your medical information with you. Oh, sure. But, um... Well, for that now, part, they could do what they do with dogs with us, just implant a little thing into the back of our heads, and they can just scan us and go, uh-huh. So, right. yeah, we're getting now, there. What, 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 would, what would be the issue with medical data, though? I mean, so, yeah, I'm sick, you know, I have this illness or that illness. What's the big... Uh, issue with any, it. any excuse to deny insurance to deny coverage uh, i see um, anything that you could have or had that mm-hmm. can immediately flag you and you will be denied okay uh, or that in that information can go to an employer and say oh that person no we don't want to hire him because of an illness that they had 10 years ago Okay, I see. Because I'm like, you know, open book. I'm like, okay, I have this illness, big deal. But now I see where you're coming from. That makes sense. But you know what? F- w- I, I agree. I'm fairly open about anything. But yet mm-hmm. that can be used against you. Right. And, and well, uh, be, As with be. anything else, though. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not into labor laws where you have to be, everybody has to be, you know, you have to hire anybody just for whatever reason. I think mm-hmm. you try whoever you want. It's mm-hmm. you know I don't think the government should tell you who to hire, what to hire, or right. or what reason to hire. You know, that's that's idiocies that just make for worse hiring. Mm-hmm. But you know that's just I, I guess. Yeah, and you know, but the same thing can be said. For example, like your financial data. I know during the last this past recession, uh, when there were a lot of layoffs and people were trying to uh, become employed again, they were running their financial their yeah, um, absolutely, and that's wrong. And that's I say I agree. I think and, it's absolutely and, and wrong. And it's so wrong. someone has a foreclosure, you don't give them a job. I mean, yeah. that doesn't even and, make and sense. And it's wrong on so many levels because, frankly, the whole financial system is gamed, and mm-hmm. the the whole credit report system is a big scam. The mm-hmm. point system, when they went to the points, it's an absolute scam, because right. th- that point system was based on how much credit you had, not mm-hmm. how much money you had or how much mm-hmm. money you made. It was based on how right. much credit you had. The mm-hmm. more you had, the higher your points, and the more you paid mm-hmm. off. You pay one thing off late and your points go down. It's just a scam. It's just it, it is a racket. And and you have, if you've ever called a, a credit card company and you said, Hey, I need to get a credit um I need to get a credit uh, increase. Yeah. And they say they run your credit and they say, Well, okay, you've been denied. Okay, well, why have I been denied? My credit score my credit score is seven forty. Well, we use different criteria. Well, can you tell me what the criteria are? Well, I'm not the person to tell you. Right, exactly. uh, you it's another department. It's well, can sc- you transfer me to that department? Oh, they don't take calls. Right. So you're not you're denying me, but you're not telling me why. Right. Oh, they'll tell you why, but it's a it's a worthless reason. Anyway, well, we've been yeah. going on for about fifty five minutes. So I yes, think, we have. I think we're going to become the top pet peeve pretty soon if we keep it up. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, uh, we had a lot of act- activity in the chat room. Um, there's. A lot of folks who are chiming in, and we really want to appreciate. Uh, we really want to thank you guys for uh, being in the chat room. Really appreciate that you showed up and that you, you know, added your two cents, five cents yep. worth. Of, uh, that's for the chat room. That's for the chat room. Thanks everyone for 
for contributing. We really appreciate you being here today. Yeah, and I think in the future we're going to have another, not necessarily this kind of format, but we'll have another one right. where we're going to have the chat room kind of guide the direction of the show. So, yeah. So get ready mm -hmm. for some of that stuff too because we want you guys involved. This is yeah. part of social learning. Exactly. Anyway, guys, everyone have a good one. If you're watching the show, please continue and subscribe. We appreciate it. And if you're live, stay alive. We like you there. Anyway, have a good one, and we will chat real soon. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.